Okay, so this is the, um, the fourth and, uh, and final lecture um, where I try to say all the things that I wish I'd said um, in early lectures. Um, unfortunately, I won't talk about uh, mixed modular forms. I didn't get that far and I apologize for that. Um, but I will say um, a, a few things that, that I believe are important and to illustrate what they are and what they mean, I will first uh, motivate uh, with the case of P1 minus 3 points. Even though I don't want to talk about P1 minus 3 points very much at all, um, I just will write down the key ingredients as I see it in the theory, and then I will replicate them or give generalizations of them in the case of M11. So uh, the zeroth section then is motivation for this lecture um, from P1 minus 3 points. And I'm going to briefly summarize um, most of the ingredients in the motivic theory um, and, and say why they're important. So what we have here is, as I've mentioned this a few times already, we have Betty and Duram fundamental groups. Oh, sorry. <laughs> they're not fundamental groups. They're fundamental torsors of paths because we're going from 0 to 1. Um, so this is the unipotent completion or the Duram pi 1 of p1 minus 3 points from a tangent vector at 1 to a negative tangent vector of length 1 at 1. And these are schemes over q. And they are, connect they are related to each other by a comparison isomorphism. So this is a morphism of schemes. Um, and then there's um, an element that plays a very important role, which is the droit chemin um, in the topological fundamental group, which is the path, the straight line path going from uh, 0 to 1, or rather the tangent vector of length 1 at 0 to the tangent vector of length minus 1 at 1, and it's simply the, the straight line. No, my, my line is not very straight. Do that again. So that's the, the droit chemin. And it, it gives an element in the Betty fundamental group, its rational points. And then we push it across into the Durand fundamental group and its image in um, the complex points of the Duran fundamental group is the Drinfeld associator. So I've explained that a number of times already. Um, so there's a sum over some words in, um, in two letters, and the coefficients are shuffle regularized multiple zeta values. And last time we discussed what the analog of this should be in genus 1 and um, discuss the analog of, of relations satisfied, um, which, which in the case of the Drinfeld associated the hexagon and pentagon equations. Um, right, so then this we've more or less covered. So the next stage in the theory is, um, is to make things, is, is to put in the, the motivic point of view. So the way th that this is done these days for in this situation, though, of course, in the early days, it, it, we didn't have um, a category of mixed tape motive, so you won't have to do something else. But now um, we say that these schemes are the realizations of something else, a motivic fundamental group. If I write with a subscript M, motivic fundamental group. Um, so what that means to say that the group uh, sorry, the scheme is, is a realization of a motive. What it means is that the, rather the affine ring, we have an object which we think of as the affine ring of, of a scheme, um, which is an end object uh, in a category of mixed tape motives over the integers. 
and its Betty realization is the affine ring of the, the Betty scheme, and its Duram realization is the um, affine ring of the Duram scheme, and you have uh, other realizations as well. So this was done by Deline and Gontrov, or defined by Deline and Gontrov. Okay, so then what do you get from this? Well, the next stage in the story is to, um, is to, to interpret this. So a, a motive or an object in an abelian category, or in a Tanakian category of motives, is simply a vector space plus the action of a group. So the category of mixed tape motives, because it is a Tanakian category, is the same as the representations of a certain affine group scheme that I'm going to write. So the, the group schemes, if I do it correctly and consistently, will have curly Gs. So that the, the motivic Gallo groups will have curly Gs, whereas all other groups will, will, will not have a tail. So I hope I do that consistently. So a mixed tape motive is simply a, a vector space plus the action of a particular group, which is the motivic Gallo group of this category. So it's the Duram motivic Galois group of this category. And this functor is, is the is the Duram realization functor. So what we're getting then is is um, some schemes um, and uh, the extra data of a group MTZ acting on one of them, on the Duran one. So we get uh, some object with a group acting on it. And this encodes all the motivic theory. Um, of course, you can also replace Duran with Betty, if you like. Um, but there's no loss of information in just restricting to a single fiber functor. And Duran is by far and away the most convenient in this story. So the point of this is that the structure of O pi 1 M as a motive is completely equivalent by the Tanaka theorem to the um, action of this group on the scheme O pi 1 Duran. And this in turn is completely equivalent to the action of this group on, um, on I'd like to say, multiple zeta values. But to make this rigorous, I have to put little motivic in brackets. So the first point is that this group action really contains all the information. It really knows everything that there is to know about pi one minus three, uh, p1 minus 3 points, or the fundamental group of p1 minus 3 points. I'm sorry, um, when you write uh, yeah. topology for the same as Betty, as you put it. Um, no, so that, yeah, I, I skipped this because I did this last time. There's, there's a map, there's always a map, um, pi one top, I won't repeat the rest, goes into the Betty points, into the rational points of the Betty, and it's Zariski dense. And the same happens in relative completion. So I, I skipped that step when I when I um. um so one the way I prefer to think about this is that this you 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 can imagine that there's a, a Galois theory of transcendental numbers like multiple zeta values, and this the action of this Galois group on these numbers should be so that that, that Galois action is, c is clearly conjectural, but you can make it absolutely rigorous by replacing numbers with something called motivic periods, and then this action of this group is completely equivalent to an action on the motivic versions of these numbers. So that's something that's quite concrete and um, is used a lot. Um, and and the, the point is that it's all completely encoded in the data of this action. And without wishing to give an entire course on this, because I've done it before, um, you can deduce a lot of fun things. Uh, for example, to prove results here between multiple zeta values, but between periods, you just compute numbers. So here you can prove theorems using complex analysis, for example. And um, because of this equivalence, you can push them back to statements into the actual motive. 
and you can result, deduce results about the eladic structure of, of um, the um, P1 minus three points, this fundamental group, and you can deduce results about p-adic periods as well. So that um, illustrates the power of this point of view. Okay, so all that to say that um, the, this technology of having um, motivic multiple zetas and, and uh, uh, hop algebra or co-algebra uh, co structure on them um, is, is used all the time, but it really comes from this group action. So the, the key point then is to determine this group action. And for me, it's one of the most important points in, in the whole theory. So we need to know how this Mativic Galois group acts on 0 pi 1 Duram. In other words, we get a map from this group into the group of automorphisms, 0 pi 1 Duram. That's what it means to for this group to act on, on this scheme. And we know that this, or th that this Galois group satisfies certain constraints. It's constrained in some way, so it lands in some subgroup of the group of automorphisms that I will just denote with a prime for now, since I'm, I don't want to go into the whole theory. And the key point here is that this subgroup can be described quite explicitly, and it turns out actually to be isomorphic as a, as a scheme, but not a well, as a scheme, because this is, there is no group structure here, it turns out to be isomorphic to, isomorphic to um, the fundamental group itself. And what you get from that then, um, is something slightly strange, you get an action of, of this pi 1 on itself, which exactly reflects the action of the Tivic Galois group. So this is, um, in some sense, this is what's confusing about the theory, because in p1 minus 3 points, the role of this automorphism group gets confused with the role of um, the, the torso of paths. And um, that causes a lot of confusion. In the case of M11, we'll see um, that it's very slightly different. Okay, so this was um, first done by um, Ihara. And it's, as I mentioned, it's extremely important. So we can describe this action, the action of this, this group on um, o pi 1 Duram explicitly. So there's an explicit formula um, perhaps I'll just give it, I, 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 I'm, I didn't prepare this so my conventions may be the wrong way around but essentially um, if you represent this by group-like formal power series in two variables, then you get an operation on formal power series in two variables, which is something like multiply by f on the left, and then you do some non-commutative substitution uh, like this. So f, f and g are functions. Um, our group-like formal power series in, in summary, coefficients in summary. Um, so you get a very concrete formula. This was uh, um, discovered by Ihara, and then from this, it's a, a very short argument to dualize this. This is explained in my, my um, lecture at the, the ICM proceedings. You dualize this, and you get a, a co-action formula for multiple zeta values, essentially, motivic multiple zeta values. And we use that all the time. So really, the, the heart is understanding this group action. So this implies formula for um, co-action on motivic MZVs. And you can really use this to compute. It's actually absolutely extraordinary that this whole philosophy gives anything at all um, I feel like saying that the, the more you understand this, the more surprising it becomes that these very general considerations actually give you any information at all. But in fact, um, 
you get an enormous amount of information from this coaxial. In fact, it completely determines all the relations between multiple zetas. So um, the next stage then is um, some input from the motivic theory. Um, more precisely, Borel's theorems on algebraic K theory um, tell us something about the size of this motivic Galois group. And in fact, we know that the, the Lie algebra of the unipotent radical of this motivic Galois group or that it's associated graded, is isomorphic to the free Lie algebra on generators um, sigma 3, sigma 5, sigma 7, and so on, where sigma 2n plus 1 is in degree minus 2n minus 1. And these are the very famous um, zeta elements, sometimes called Sule elements, Uh, graded. Uh, you can just put, if you don't like it, you can put the completion of the free Lie algebra on these elements. Um, and um, so these sigmas correspond in some sense to the odd zeta values, which in turn uh, control the, the structure, of the, the whole structure of the ring of multiple zeta values through this uh, mechanism. So this um, controls this Lie algebra controls the structure of motivic MZVs and hence all MZVs. Um, so you get from this, so I don't want to do the whole course on this, but you, you get upper bounds from, for the, 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 the dimensions of the space of, of numbers in this way, it's very concrete. And so sort of the final piece that I want to get to is the theorem that I proved a few years ago, which was called, previously called the delaney hara conjecture, um, which is that this Lie algebra, in other words, the, the sigma 3, sigma 5, uh, act freely. So uh, let me write a freely algebra as a, uh, a blackboard L. So then this freely algebra, this Lie algebra acts freely on, um, on 0 pi 1 Duram. And that implies that, in fact, um, that this uh, that the, the pi 1 of p1 minus 3 points, in fact, generates the whole category of mixed state motives over the integers. So now what I want to, I really don't want to talk about this, but I will repeat all of this for genus 1 and um, explain um, how to get a group. So we don't have a category of motives in this case, but I will explain how to cook up something, some category of realizations that, that will do the job. We're going to get a group acting on everything. I want to then describe uh, the Hodge structure underlying the, um, the, the, the relative completion. Then I want to describe the um, automorphisms of this structure and how the Galois group acts. And then I want to explain what the analogues of these sigmas are going to be. And I will conclude with a Freenus theorem, which is an analogue of, of this result in the case of genus 1. Sorry? It's, it's a conjecture or what? What, what I'm going to say later. This is a theorem. No, not a theorem. Oh, um, yeah, I'll, I'll state a theorem. Of, I'll state a Freenus theorem, generalizes this, that involves zeta elements, but also modular elements. But <laughs> the caveat is that um, that's not the whole story, that there's an infinite sequence of infinite sequences of generators. They're not just modular and zeta elements, they're rank and Selberg elements, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's the issue. Um, but, in, but it's extraordinary. This is a, a, a tricky, very tricky combinatorial and analytic argument. Um, it uses some, some uh, difficult identity due to Zagier um, between multiple zetas proved by Fragman Lindelof principle. It uses a tricky combinatorial argument. Um, in, in the genus one situation, this theorem is going to pop out 
without, without any effort. It's just going to pop out of the structure from the description of this group, the analog of this group. So we'll, we'll see that. OK, so now um, the case M11. So this is what we're really interested in. And the first point is then, um, as a substitute for motives, we're going to work with Hodge structures. So the Betty and Durham completions, um, G11, B, and DR, have not, a, not just a, a mixed Hodge structure, but a limiting mixed Hodge structure. So this is a, a new feature that we don't see in Gina Zero, and it's very important indeed, as I will try to explain at the very, very end. So this was computed by Hain, or defined by Hain, um, in a very slightly different context, but it's equivalent. OK, so what does a limiting mixed hot structure have? Well, it has a geometric weight filtration, W, but it also has um, another weight filtration, M, and the, it has a Hodge filtration. So this is called the monodromy, or I might just call it the weight filtration without any adjective. And F is the Hodge filtration. Right, so the, 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 the weight filtration as a motive, if you like, is M. It's not W. And we think of this as, as a mixed Hodge structure with an extra with an extra um, filtration W. So how this is going to be encoded, so I want to encode this data in the following way, that we're going to have um, some rings, OG1 Betty, affine ring, OG11 Duram, and there's a comparison isomorphism between them. And this is going to be encoded as a W filtered uh, end object of a category H of mixed hot structures, which I'm going to define now. So what's going on here is that we've got some, some uh, local systems or, or variations of, of uh, variations over M11, and on those there's a weight filtration W. And so you can you can you can look at the, the, the WN part of that. You can stop the filtration at a certain point, and you get a variation. And when you take the limit, you get a genuine mixed hot structure. So, uh, so the upshot is we get W. For each step in the W filtration, we get an actual mixed hot structure. And there's a lot of extra data that goes into a limiting mixed hot structure um, that I'm going to ignore for now. But it will come back, um, come back very shortly. So the first thing then is to define the category H. So let H be a category um, whose objects are triples. Consisting of So I think a version of this category was first um, written down by Deligne. Um, so VB and VDR are finite dimensional Q vector spaces um, with an increasing filtration M. So my, my habit is to write W in this context, like everybody else, but I have to, we have to remind ourselves that it's, it's M now. Weight filtration is denoted by M. So if I accidentally write W, please stop me. Um, so VDR also has a decreasing filtration F. So these are filtrations of Q vector spaces, and they are finite and um, exhaustive. Then C is an isomorphism f 
from the, between the complexifications of these vector spaces, which respects the weight filtration M. Um, there's the data of um, a real Frobenius, which is very useful, um, especially for constructing uh, modular forms I mentioned in the first lecture, and which I won't have time to do. Um, since actually I won't need it, I'm just going to drop it and put it in brackets. We'll skip that. And then the key uh, condition is that the vector space VB equipped with the filtration M and equipped with the filtration F on its complexification is a um, graded polarizable Q mixed hot structure, whose definition I won't give. It's very well known. And it's just uh, some linear, al linear algebra conditions on the filtrations. Um, and then the morphisms in this category are what you think they are. So morphism is given between a triple is is what you think. So it's it's given by linear maps phi b to phi b prime and phi Duram that respects everything. So there's a commutative diagram involving C and C prime um, that, that needs to commute. There's a, these maps need to respect the M filtrations, the F filtration in this case, and so on and so forth. So I'll just say that this has to be compatible with the above data. Right, so then this forms a, an abelian category so there's an obvious notion of direct sum, there's no, a notion of dual, a notion of tensor product. So it's a Q-linear um, abelian tensor category with duals. In other words, it's in fact a Tanakian category. Um, so, and it comes equipped with two fiber functors, omega Betty or Duram, which is a functor from this category to vector spaces, finite dimensional vector spaces over Q. And um, it sends a triple to the corresponding, either the, 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 the Betty vector space or the Duram vector space. So that's a fiber functor, that's a neutral Tanakian category over Q. Um, and so from this we get a group, of course. So we let G, so this is the, what's going to play the role of a Mativic Galois group. So it's going to get a curly G, B or DR. There'll be two such groups. Is defined to be the automorphisms of the corresponding fiber functor in this category. So this is an affine group scheme over Q. Um, and it plays the role of the Mativic Gallo group. And in fact, so in the case of mixed state motives, uh, it, it, it's no loss to, to, to work in a category realizations. Um, the, the corresponding group acts in an identical way to the Mativic Galois group. So it's literally the same thing. Okay, so okay, so now I want to state a theorem um, about I want to put relative completion, view relative completion as an object in this category somehow. So let me remind you briefly that G11, the Betty and Duram relative completions that we defined are group schemes over Q, affine group schemes. So what that means is that the ring of functions in either case um, are 
commutative Hopf algebras. That's what it means for this to be an affine group scheme. Um, so in particular, there's a lot of data that comes into this, but there's a co-product. All right, so we have a co-product and other stuff. And the, the comparison isomorphism then is an isomorphism of uh, Hopf algebras right so so now what we want to do then is view the, the affine Betty ring, the affine Duram ring, and this comparison is a triple, and it's going to be a triple in this category. But, uh, I need... Oh. Hmm. Uh, I need the, uh, the board eraser. No, there is none. Um, That's strange. Yeah. Ah, oh, yeah. Thank you. There are many. Good. Okay, so the theorem then, which is um, most of the work is contained in the work of Descain. This is the corollary of Haynes' work. Um, that the affine ring of the Betty uh, relative completion has natural filtrations W and M Dram has natural filtrations W M and F such that um, such that OG one Betty comp is, I'll say it this way, then explain a little bit what it means. So this is a W filtered Hopf algebra object in H, rather end object. So what that means, uh, slightly more concretely, so this is how we encode this, this geometric weight filtration. Um, it's just saying that um, for every n, uh, if we, we, uh, we only consider the weight n part, the wn part of these rings, Then, um, then this is this is an object. In fact, an end object. It may be infinite dimensional. Maybe sort of a limit of objects in H. But if, if we if we take any m m filtered piece of it, it will be finite dimensional. Um, and and it is compatible. And this structure is compatible with the data that goes into Hopf algebra. In other words, this co these co-products um, are, are consistent with, with all these filtrations and all these structures. So compatible with the Hopf algebra structure. Um, so there's more to come for this theorem. 
a little bit more, but I'm just going to postpone it. We can be a bit more precise about this. So let me stop the th pause the theorem for now. Um, so that's already a, a very um, quite a tight constraint on on the structure of this thing. But something that seems um, completely trivial, but again is also extremely important, um, is the local monodromy at the cusp. So I, I sometimes call this inertia for reasons that will become clear. So the local monodromy at the cusp um, defines a map um, from the topological fundamental group of GM the tangent vector 1 at 0 into um, topological fundamental group of m11 d by dq, which is just SL2z. So um, I've drawn this picture already. Um, this is, the, this is the, um, the, the, the chart given by the, the, um, the punctured disk. So if we draw the punctured disk uh, d star, uh, and remove the origin, then we have the tangent vector of length 1, which is just the same thing as d by dq. And here we have uh, a loop going round the origin in a positive direction. And that gives us, in M11, it gives us a, a, um, a, a loop around the cusp. And it corresponds precisely to the matrix uh, T, which we studied last time. So essentially, we have a, a, a copy of the um, Mativic fundamental group of GM, which is a very simple thing, uh, sitting inside the relative completion of SL2Z. Um, and so this, this thing is, is geometric, or Mativic if you like. Um, and therefore, this morphism, this homomorphism of fundamental groups, actually gives morphisms of the, on the level of completions. Another way to say that is, in fact, by universal properties of completion, of relative completion, you deduce that the same is true on the level of uh, B and DR. We get a map into G one one B slash DR. So these are morphisms of group schemes. So uh, how is this encoded? And when we want to say that this a morphism like this is a morphism compatible with with Hodge theory, and the way to say that is then that, that somehow this is a morphism in the category H. So I, I will use that sort of language, but what what, what such a statement means is that um, on, on the affine rings, you get a, a genuine map between objects of H. So to spell that out, uh, this morphism of group schemes translates into a homomorphism of Hopf algebras in the opposite direction, and hence a map of triples So what this means to be a morphism um, of group schemes in the category H, the definition is that on the affine 
rings, we're getting a, a morphism of Hopf algebra objects. in H. All right, so that's exactly what it means. So this encodes, um, so in, in the theory of limiting mixed Hodge structure, there's a, a very important role played by the, um, the, the nilpotent, nilpot, nilpotent operator. And this is how it comes into this, how it comes into the theory. So it's encoded by the data of a map of the Mativic fundamental group of GM into our group scheme. Um, so to, to make that a little bit more concrete and make the connection, um, this object is very simple. In fact, it's Lie algebra um, So I think of this group as a, as a group in H then I can take its, 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 its pro-unipotent, so I can take its Lie algebra, and its Lie algebra is the Tate object I mean, the, 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 it's pro-unipotent, so it's completely determined by its Lie algebra, what I mean. Um, so the, and the Lie algebra is just the Tate object Q of 1, so where Q of 1 uh, is Q of 1 is an object of H, and it's just the object given by the pair of vector spaces Q and Q, and the isomorphism between them sends 1 to 2 pi i inverse. So that's the, the, the Tate object. And so um, if you're familiar with the theory of limiting mixed hot structures, uh, what we've got then is just a map. On the level of Lie algebras, we've got a map from Q of 1 into here, and um, the image of a generator here therefore gives an, an endomorphism on this. So this encodes um, the nilpotent operator um, n, which is also the logarithm, just the logarithm of this path, log t. So T viewed as, as an element in, uh, in, in Betuel Duram um, in the theory of limiting mixed hot structures. Um, and this also explains why when last week we computed the periods um, of, of relative completion along T's, in other words, we computed iterated integrals of modular forms along T, and I explained that they were only involved 2 pi i, powers of 2 pi i, and that's clear from this picture because they pull back to periods of, of GM, and the only periods of GM are periods of Q of 1, um, and the period of Q1 is, is essentially a 2 pi i. So um, this remark explain, makes it obvious why the periods of T only involve uh, 2 pi i, or the powers of 2 pi i. OK, so in some sense, uh, this T thing is, is trivial. It comes from something that's geometrically very trivial. But the point is that it, it sits inside relative completion in quite a complicated way. Um, and as I explained last time, that's reflected by the fact that um, Eisenstein series have a, um, have, have a non-trivial zero through coefficient, and that involves Bernoulli numbers. So it, you, can, you can actually, I'm not going to have time to do it, but you can write out what n looks like, the image of n in this, in Betty or in Duram, and you get a, a power series involving um, Eisenstein generators, Bernoulli numbers, and, um, and you also get the Peterson inner product between cusp forms. So that, it's actually quite a tricky object. So now let me reformulate um, this, this local monodromy in a different way again. 
So another way to say it then is that we've got a map of Duram fundamental groups Um, so we've got a homomorphism, or morphism of group schemes, and since these are um, Duram realizations of pro objects in H, they get an action of this um, Galois group G Duram H is going to act on on both of them in a compatible way. Um, so compatibly with this morphism. So that um, seems very trivial, but it actually gives a huge amount of information on the, this, this uh, action of this metallic Galois group. This Galois group. Um, so before proceeding with uh, the description of this, this action, I want to write down, um, remind you of the structure of relative completion and explain its hodge, explain what these three filtrations look like. So it's slightly tricky. Um, so here's a description of the hodge structure or really rather just the filtrations on the Duram um, relative completion. So it's much simpler to write things in terms of the Lie algebra. So um, recall that U11 Duram is the radical, the pro-unipotent radical of G11 Duram. And let lowercase u11 Duram be its Lie algebra. So this has a mixed hot structure as well, um, and I'm going to describe it. So, as I mentioned a few times already, this is isomorphic to the completion of a free Lie algebra on certain generators, and they were um, given by Eisenstein series and um, for each cusp form there were a pair of generators EF prime and EF double prime so we're here, here F um, cusp form so last time we chose a basis of cusp forms with rational coefficients, rational Fourier coefficients. Okay. Um, so these generators are, are non-canonical. Um, now, so briefly we have um, so these x's and y's were elements, were basis of a, a vector space. So everything, basically everything can be promoted to the category H. So since the beginning of these lectures, we've had a Betty thing going on, a Duram thing going on. And the bottom line is that everything can just take place in H. So the, in particular, this vector space has been playing a role, Vn. We can now view it as an object in H. And I remind you that Vn Duram was this vector space with these, these bold generators x and y. Um, but now we can put a mixed hot What we gain now is a mixed hot structure. So these x and y aren't just uh, variables now. They're going to have uh, uh, m and w and f filtrations. So VnH was defined to be, way back in the first lecture, the symmetric and symmetric power of V1. So I just need to describe the Hodge theory of V1. And in fact, V1 of H 
is, as an object in H, it's simply a direct sum of two Tate objects. Um, and why is that the case? Um, so this is a, a well-known fact that the, if you take the limit mix hot structure on the cohomology of the universal elliptic curve, so this was the universal elliptic curve, at the fiber, at the point, well, at, at the tangential base point d by dq, this has a limiting mixed hot structure and it's exactly this. Sorry, I think I want, I want homology. If I want, is it plus, plus one, so I want homology. <coughs> Um, so, put another way, um, that tells us that um, x, the meaning of the variable x then is that it's a copy of q of 0. So, um, and the meaning of y is that it's going to span a copy of q of 1. So in terms of the M and F filtrations, the Hodge numbers with respect to M and F are here 0, 0. Um, I shouldn't put that. There. So the, the Hodge numbers with respect to M and F. And here they're minus 1, minus 1. And they're both going to sit. We're going to view these. Since we're working with W filtered objects in H, we're going to put, stick these in W equals 0. And then the... Um, X and Y form a basis of V1? Yes, uh, yes, X and Y form a basis of V1, and the powers of X form a basis of its symmetric power. So exactly, X, X is a generator here, and Y... X is a generator of, of the Duram component of this vector space, and Y is a generator of the Duram component of this vector space. Um, so it's just saying that, that these X and Ys carry weights, essentially. It's not, not a big deal. But now the crux of the matter then is that the Eisenstein generators um, also have a mixed hot structure. So they correspond to um, Q of 1. Um, so that's the M and F Hodge numbers they are, are again minus 1 and minus 1. Um, but, so this follows from the work of Steenbrink and Zucker on, on limiting mixed hot structures of curves. This is going to sit in weight, in, in geometric weight, minus 2 and minus 2. And then the cusp forms, and that's really because it has a, um, the corresponding differential form has a pole at the cusp. That pushes the, the W weight up, or down in this case. Um, and then EF prime, EF double prime, is going to be a copy of VF1, where VF was the hot structure of a cusp form. So I, I defined in an early lecture the motive of, a, I mentioned the motive of cusp forms. They have a hot structure. And they were both take twisted by one. So the Hodge numbers of the motive of a, of a cusp form twisted by one are 2n minus 1 and minus 1, 2n. And these are going to sit in W equals minus 1. So, um, so this is pretty tricky. And I have to admit that we don't really know how to extract uh, all the information from these filtrations um, at present. You, you've got a sort of three-dimensional picture with these three filtrations. It's quite hard to visualize. Um, it gives a lot of constraints. Certainly the M and W are going to play a very important role and give a lot of constraints. But I, I have the feeling that there's more to be extracted from this. So what I'm going to do now is maybe we have a brief break and I will draw a picture, if I can, of this Lie algebra with its Hodge structure, um, which is a moment I've been dreading because it's quite uh, uh, hard to get it right on the board. So I, shall, I can do that whilst you have a coffee. 
And then you'll, when you come back, you'll see a beautiful picture. We'll make all these filtrations abundantly clear. Okay, so this is a, um, this is a drawing of, um, of the Lie algebra of G, or more precisely of SL2 semi-direct U11 Duran. So SL2 is, uh, is up in weight zero. It's generated by these two differential operators, x d by dy and y d by dx. And their commutator is um, h, which is uh, the degree in y minus the degree in x, or, or, or the other way around. So then we have, um, so that's SL2, and the rest are the generators of U11 Duran. So um, we ignore the, the Hodge filtration F for now, and we just look at the, the M weight filtration um, and the W going down the blackboard. So this is the geometric weight filtration, and M is the, the, the monodromy weight filtration. Um, now, the, the first, um, oh yeah, the first thing to say is that um, negative numbers go to the right. That's, that's a bad habit that we've got, got into, but it, it's, it's stuck. Um, it's convenient to do it this way. It's harder to draw the other way. So uh, negative numbers go down here, but they go to the right, and positive numbers to the left. And the first uh, surprising thing, which is that all the cusp forms are floating very high at the top. So the cusp forms are all sitting in W equals minus 1. So for every um, cuspital generator, you have an EF prime and an EF double prime. So EF here stands for both copies. It means EF prime and EF double prime. And we get some uh, elements uh, sitting way up at the top in the W filtration. Then the Eisenstein generators go way down in the W filtration. And the other thing to say is that the, this, this SL2 acts in the obvious way on, on these blocks. So uh, xd by dy moves you left two blocks, uh, yd by dx moves you to the right by two blocks, and indeed this generates um, a standard representation of SL2. This generates a, a, a representation of SL2 of dimension 3, and so on and so forth. So here on the left we have highest weight vectors, and the extremity, we have lowest weight vectors, um, which are annihilated by, um, by, by this operator here, yd by dx. So you explain that you have the symmetric. So yeah, so what I've drawn, what I explained, so you add, add the room. So what I've drawn is uh, the, the semi-direct product of SL2 on U11 Duran. So it's a Lie algebra, U1, it's a Lie algebra, it's a free Lie algebra, in the category of mixed hot structures with an action of SL2. So the SL2, I'll say it again, SL2 is up here at the top in orange. It's x d by dy and y d by dx, and the commutator is an h, which is the degree in x minus degree in y. And the h invariance is this red line here. And the red line sits, so the red line is, where should I put it? Uh, so the red line, so the red line is m equals w. And it contains all the SL2 invariants. That's going to be important. So already, we don't, we, we don't have any SL2 invariants in, in the generators. You have to take Lie brackets uh, of, of at least two of these things to get an, an SL2 invariant um, piece. So the, the, the key point is that the Eisenstein series go down in the W filtration very fast. And they're all lined up to begin at, at the, uh, in the m equals minus 2 column, and extend to the right. But all the cusp forms are very much at, up, up at the top. And that's some very important fact that, that, that is just true, and it's useful, but we, I don't feel we've really fully exploited this very particular structure. I think there's a lot more information that can be obtained out of this. So this is m and w. Then I've ignored the, the, the Hodge filtration f, which I've written in a little table there for convenience. So if you want to think of the Hodge filtration F, you can imagine another filtration coming out of the blackboard in three dimensions, and things are sitting, these things are sitting at, at strange diagonals coming in and out of the blackboard, if you have the, the sort of a three-dimensional picture with F as well 
Um, and I, I just don't know how to draw that on a piece of paper, but if someone has an idea, that would be useful. Okay, so this is what the, the Lie algebra of Durham, the Durham relative completion looks like in all its glory, or rather in most of its glory, since we've ignored the Hodge filtration for this picture. Um, just, just as a remark, by comparison, um, you know, if we were to draw the same picture for P1 minus three points, um, the Durand fundamental group is just, it's just the free Lie algebra on two generators, E0 and E1. So the corresponding picture for, for this we would only have one filtration, we only have M, and we just have E0 and E1 sitting in one slot. So, so this is the analogous picture for P1 minus three points is that. It's not very interesting. Um, but we see this incredible richness uh, in, on, on M11, on, on for SL2Z. So what we've got then is this, this object that, that, that just exists. Um, it's, it's a motive, or it's a dram realization of, an ob of a motive. And the, the Galois group is going to act on this, this whole thing. Um, and clearly it's very rich indeed. So I now want to try to describe, oh yeah, if I forgot to say, so of course the, these are just the generators, um, and then you have Lie brackets, you have commutators between these elements. So the, the Lie bracket of E4x squared and E6x to the 4 will be somewhere in W minus 10, and it'll be over here in, in this column. So for example, you have e 4 x squared, Lie bracket, and so on and so forth. So when you take um, Lie brackets of, of Eisenstein elements, they're going to move to the right. So you say that the action of SL2Z on V1 is a natural one? Um, no, so to get SL2 to act, I need to choose a splitting. So we had, um, yeah, so I was sl slightly cheated here. Or, or I hadn't until I wrote down a commutator, but we have G Duran 1, 1, and it sits in an exact sequence, SL2, which I put a Duran for bookkeeping purposes, and it has a unipotent radical. But then what we can do is then to, to, to write things, to compute, it's always useful to, to split this. So we choose a splitting, um, and I mentioned this last time, but the fact What's new here, so SL2 acts on the right, and we have SL2. What's new now is that we have um, Hodge structures. So the fact of the matter is that you can always choose a splitting compatibly with all the uh, M, W, and F filtrations. So you can split compatibly with W, M, and F. And then what that, th once you've chosen a splitting, that's the same thing as choosing an action of SL2 on G, or on, on U. And on the level of the Lie algebra, you get this guy, and that's what I've drawn. No, but uh, I was mentioning SL2Z. Ah, SL2Z, sorry. Um, no, there's no action of SL2Z per se. Uh, no, it's really an action of, of SL2, the Lie algebra. Yeah. So SL2Z will appear, but in a different in a slightly different way. So, but, but SL2 acts on V1 in a natural way. Uh, that's correct. Um, so th that's really the, be the Betty, so SL2Z is really the Betty side because SL2Z is the fundamental group. And you always get a map from the fundamental group into the Betty, into the Q rational points of the Betty relative completion. But this is, I've drawn Duram here, so, um, it, it, it is not, not, the, not the best way to think about it in the Duran picture. So the way that SL2 acts, so this is what I explained last time. So how does SL2Z act here? Well, in fact, you're, you're right. But um, maybe I'll, I'll recap. So I did this last time. SL2Z acts here via these co-cycles. So we had um, SL2Z going to G uh, Betty 1, 1, Q. And then via the comparison, that gave us something in G11 Duram C, isomorphic to SL2 Duram semi-direct U11 Duram C. 
And so every element, every matrix gives us gamma. I call this gamma bar because there's some irritating 2 pi i's, but in this basis you won't see them. And then a co-cycle C gamma. So this co-cycle somehow, it, if you think of it, the path gamma ends up being spread throughout the whole Duran picture. So the path S, which we had last time, is going to do what you think it does up here on the SL2 part, and then it's going to have some, the co-cycle CS is going to spread it out with all these periods all through the Durand. The connection between the set 2Z and the Durand is set 2 Is that this one? That's, that's gamma goes to gamma bar. So I explained, I explained that last time. It's just it's essentially the same matrix, but with two pi i's in there. And, um, and then I switched, I've, I've switched bases from these Durand and Betty bases, and that eats up the two pi i's. This two pi i's is a five factor of Q0 on one side. Exactly, exactly. It's just bookkeeping. So um, that's sometimes. So here I'm writing the, the, the bold x's, and last time when I did the co-cycle, I, I wrote it using the, the other x and y, but th these, these are essentially the same, and these differ by um, multiplying or dividing by 2 pi i. So it's just... Exactly. That, that's the origin of the 2 pi i, which is very irritating, but it's, it's very important. Right, so now um, let me describe the Galois action then. So Galois on inverted commas, it's not a classical Galois group in any sense. Um, so G1 run Duram is Duram component of a pro object in H. Um, therefore, it has an action of the automorphisms of the category H. So this action knows everything. This is, the, B, this is the, the holy grail. If we could understand this action, we would know everything there is to know about mixed modular motives. So this action, I'll just write that quickly, uh, knows everything, i.e. completely determines Um, the structure of G11 as an object of H. Um, and hence, the category, which I mentioned a few lectures back, so I define a category of mixed modular motives, MMM gamma. I'll remind you the definition here. It's just the full subcategory It's the full subcategory of H. Uh, generated by this full ten full Tanakian subcategory of H generated by the affine ring OG11. So that means it's all subobjects and quotient objects, duals, tensor products thereof, etc. Um, so that's a, that's a that's what I define to be the category of mixed modular motives. And understanding this category is equivalent to understanding this action. Of course, we can enhance this category H. I'm just working with Betty and Duran because it's uh, the, way, the quickest way to get information about this action. But you can throw in other realizations if you like. So then the question is, how on earth could we possibly compute this action? Um, and it seems hopeless, but in fact, surprisingly, you can get very far. So I'm going to restrict the action, not of the full Galois group, but just look at the unipotent radical. And I, I, I feel like saying that, that the, the, the semi-simple part, the action of the semi-simple part, we, we sort of know that. Um, there's not much to say. It, it's really encoded by the action of Heck operators, and it's, it's understanding the pure objects in this category, and they're the motives of, of, of modular forms, uh, which we know. So uh, all the interesting stuff is in the unipotent radical. And its action on... Um, so. It, the unipotent radical acts on everything in sight, and it's going to determine all the extensions in this category. And that's what we really want to know. Right? 
Okay, so how do, what do we know about this action? Well, we know that it respects, it has to respect the local monodromy. So we know a few other things as well that I, I haven't had time to discuss, but um, most of the content is in this little picture that I'm going to draw. So we have the um, local monodromy. So this is the fundamental group of GM, just given by a single loop. And we had this map, uh, local monodromy, into G11. And I'm going to call this local monodromy Kappa, for want of a, of a better, better name. And then G11 is a, um, an extension of SL2 by its pro unipotent radical. And how, how, what, what, what does this local monodromy look like? Well, it takes a little loop in, in, the, in the Q disk, which I called gamma zero, and it sends it, as I explained, to T uh, here. But it also has a component up here, which is, which is interesting and complicated. So um, this, this morphism from G11 to SL2 is a morphism in H. And this is a subgroup in the category H. So all this, everything here, every morphism in this diagram is compatible with the Hodge theory and come from morphisms in the category H. So that means the metallic Galois group, the Galois group of H, um, respects all the maps in this diagram. And in fact, we can be much more precise that, um, um, in fact, SL2, which is just the, uh, its affine ring is, is, is given by endomorphisms of this ve vector space V, right? Um, so it's, it's just a, a, a Tate motive. It's very simple. And as I explained earlier, this um, fundamental group of the, the punctured disk, they are both Tate, well, first of all, they're pure objects, and even simpler, they're pure Tate objects. in H. So they're incredibly simple, and um, the action of this metallic Galois group on them factors through a very, very small quotient. Um, and in particular, since for simplicity I'm only going to look at the unipotent radical, the unipotent radical of this category acts trivially by definition on all pure objects. So it's going to act trivially on both SL2 and this pi1, or rather their Durand components, because it acts trivially on all pure objects in H by definition. That's the definition of U. It's the subgroup which, which um, acts trivially on, on pure objects, or direct sums of pure objects. OK, so now um, definition. Um, if I have an exact sequence of um, affine group schemes over K, where K has characteristic zero, and um, S is reductive or pro-reductive, um, and U is pro-unipotent, so this is the situation we've got with G11 over there. And what we've got then is this, th this group of symmetries acts trivially on this, acts trivially on this, and therefore, in particular, it preserves, it preserves this, this subgroup. So we want to understand when you have a, an affine group scheme acting on a short exact sequence of affine group schemes, uh, what does it look like? So if we take any um, short exact sequence of affine group schemes of pro-unipotent kernel and pro-reductive quotient, and in fact this is the general, this is the, the general uh, picture for, for, for any, um, any such um, group scheme, then um, we can define the automorphisms uh, which respect pi of G, and they are the 
automorphisms of the group scheme G, so these are group, group homomorphisms, such that um, pi alpha equals pi. Now, when I write this, what I mean is, is um, for every ring, I'm looking at the, we can take the, the ring R, we can take the R points of this group scheme, and we're looking at automorphisms on the level of points. Um, so what this is, is a, a functor, but, but I, I, write, I write it without reference to the, the, the ring of points you're taking in. So it's a functor from commutative um, K algebras to groups. And one has to be careful here, it's not the case, in general if you take a group scheme, its automorphisms is not a group scheme. Um, but there are conditions uh, under which it's true, in which it is a representable functor. In this case, it's going to be representable, so that's not a problem. Um, but I don't want to go into that, so I'll just say that this is, um, ought for me is a functor from commutative K algebras. So given a commutative K algebra R, the automorphisms over R are the um, isomorphisms of the R points of G to itself, which commute with this projection. And you say that in this case it's representable? It is uh, in, I have to think, yeah, I think, I think it is in this case, yeah. Certainly in, in, the, in the application, it's definitely representable. So somewhere I, I wrote down some conditions. So if you, if you take, um, um, you can prove that, so if you have a pro-unipotent group scheme, its automorphisms are representable. And there's a general criterion, if you have some filtrations, on the group schemes, then there's, there's a condition for representability that I, I wrote in some paper and that's on the archive. Um, and in, in this case, I think it's fine. I didn't actually check. But for the case of SL2Z, the case we're going to apply this to, uh, it's, it's, definitely, it's definitely representable. I'm just saying that one has to be a little bit careful. And, and when you think of automorphisms, this is automorphisms on the level of points. You could also ask, well, anyway, I don't want to go into it. There's, there's some subtle questions related to this, um, um, which just, just don't arise here. So then the theorem um, is that for every splitting, um, sigma of this, um, so I, I make S act on the right, I think. Um, for every splitting of this sort of exact sequence, there is a canonical isomorphism um, of this automorphism group with U semi-direct the S invariant of U ought to U S invariants. So what this means is that the automorphisms of U S invariants is the isomorphism, the automorphisms of U to itself, such that uh, they commute with with phi. So the S equivariant. So that the, the S S equivariant. Um, and so what, what are elements in this thing? So first I'll, I'll write down elements in U semi-direct or US, and then I'll explain what this superscript means. So what they are, on the level of points, they're given by pairs B comma phi, where B is in U and phi is an equivariant automorphism. Um, and th this is an equivalence relation, so we say that a pair B comma phi is equivalent to B A, uh, A inverse phi A, so this is conjugation by an element A for any 
A S invariant element of U. So this is pairs B comma phi. They form a group with the obvious semi-direct product, uh, the usual semi-direct product law, and modulo an equivalence relation, which is multiply on the right by an element of uh, an S invariant element of U and conjugate by an S invariant element of U here. And we denote the equivalence class by square brackets, B phi. So what we get then, um, because the action of this uh, group here preserves, pu respects pure objects, and this is pure and this is pure, it's going to act on G in such a way that it commutes with this projection pi, and it's going to fix the image of kappa. So to, to say that in, in equations, what we get is a map from the Durham Galois group to a certain automorphism group A Durham, which is a subgroup of the pi respecting automorphisms of G11. And it's the subgroup of autos, automorphisms. Which do which? First of all, they've got to respect the 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 Hodge the the Hodge structure, and more precisely the the weight filtrations W and M. They don't have to respect the Hodge filtration F, but they have to respect W and M, and they have to preserve. So what I mean is that they they preserve kappa and they respect. So they respect W and M. What I meant to say is, and they preserve kappa. They leave it invariant. So in my paper, there's, actually, there's an extra condition that we know that these automorphisms satisfy that I'm not talking about. So in my paper, A, A actually means something else plus an extra condition. Alas, there's not time to explain that. So then we can make this concrete then. So if we pick um, a splitting G11 Duram SL2 Duram U11 Duram, then we can write down this group in quite a concrete way using, using the theorem over there. So um, let, so here we have T and kappa plus be the image of a generator gamma of pi 1 Duram And this kappa plus is, is really another word. Kappa plus really equals um, the co-cycle CT, which we partly computed last time. Just a slightly different notation. The context is very slightly different. But it, you can think of this literally as, as this, this power series CT, which we computed. And it's, it just involves some complicated expressions in Bernoulli numbers. And, and well, we computed part of it. I mean, it also involves, it also encodes Peterson inner products. Um, so, concretely then, what a, a Duram then, via the previous theorem, can be written as being the um, W and M preserving elements in U11 Duram semi-direct um, U11 Duram SL2 um, ought U11 on one Duram SL2. I, in other words, it's the elements. Every motivic automorphism can be represented by an equivalence class B, phi, where B is here and phi is here, such that it preserves kappa. In other words, it satisfies the equation B slash T phi kappa plus B inverse equals kappa plus. And that's the condition. This is the condition that the Galois group preserves the image of, of this under the morphism kappa. And so this defines a group, um, a subgroup of automorphisms of relative completion. And it really is the analog. It's, it's a genus one analog of the grottendieck teichmuller group.
Okay. So to explain this definition a bit more carefully, um, let me explain how it acts on co-cycles, and it should, uh, it should enlighten the discussion somewhat. So the, the, the point is that um, this is actually a massive constraint on what these mativic elements, these mativic automorphisms can possibly look like. Uh, and this, this condition that looks innocuous is in fact extremely restrictive. So as a, as a remark, let's explain how this automorphism group acts on co-cycles. So we get an action of this automorphism group, and in particular these equivalence classes on co-cycles. Um, on non-abelian co-cycles, Z gamma 1, U1, 1, Duran. So I explained last time how a splitting gives you, a, a splitting of G uh, as a semi-direct product gives us co-cycles. And therefore the automorphism group is going to act on the space of co-cycles. So how does it, um, if we start off with a co-cycle C, non-abelian co-cycle, then um, B phi is going to change C and give us a new co-cycle. So we take a, a, a non-abelian co-cycle and we transform it to get a new one. And the new co-cycle, so if the old co-cycle is the map G goes to CG, then the new co-cycle is G goes to B slash G phi CG B inverse. So this is C prime G. So this is how this group of automorphism acts on co-cycles, and it's a, a very easy but quite nice exercise to check that this operation indeed preserves the co-cycle equations. So one way to think about this, which I think is the most enlightening, is that the space of non-abelian co-cycles is, um, you can think of this as a, a, a total space um, over a base, which is the non-abelian cohomology classes, which are equivalence classes of co-cycles. And, and the way I think of this action, or one way to think of this action, which is useful, is that the element phi is giving us an automorphism of the cohomology class, and the element B is twisting the, the representative of the co-cycle within that cohomology class. So that explains this dual nature of this automorphism. The, the phi, phi changes the point in the base, and then B selects a point in the fiber. Um, so we see immediately that this group respects, um, so we think of this group as a group action on multiple modular values, and it's clear from this that it respects the relations between multiple mod modular values, uh, at least those that, that come from the co-cycle equations. Um, so perhaps since I have a tiny bit of time, let me just sneak in um, how this acts on, on an example of a co-cycle, because I think it's very enlightening. So we had, um, last time, I, we computed the co-cycle of an Eisenstein series. And um, I hope I got my normalizations the same as, as last time. If not, I, I apologize. So what it looked like, um, so this co-cycle was obtained by integrating an Eisenstein series from zero to infinity. And it was, it was 2 pi i times some rational co-cycle, which I defined explicitly, plus some, 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 some constant times an odd zeta value over 2 pi i to the 2n times a co-boundary. And I explained last time that this was, this is in some sense, rash, this is rational. So this is 2 pi i rational. And this is um, a co-boundary. And it's transcendental. And I also explained that, that the cohomology class of this co-cycle is just this piece. 
This is zero in cohomology, and that's consistent with the manning drinfeld theorem. Um, this should be a rational cohomology class. Another way to say it that this, this comes from a, a Tate motive, so its period should just be 2 pi i rational. But this it has a, a non-trivial transcendental part, which is a co-boundary. So if we unravel this formula, the motivic Galois group is going to act on, this, on these co-cycles, and what it does is it, 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 it scales all the... Well, it does something uh, to all the generators E and F, and in this case, it's going to do nothing because to lowest order, phi is always the identity. So we're not going to see this at all in this example. And then it, it, it uh, multiplies by, by it, it, it modifies by a co-boundary. So if you take the coefficient of E2n plus 2 in this, what you find is that the co-cycle stays put. It's the same thing that comes in here. Then you get plus b slash g minus b, which is the addition of a co-boundary. So under... So what B phi does to this, it modifies this co-cycle by a co-boundary. So what it does is it adds, i.e. it takes this co-cycle and when you compute C prime, it's going to be the same thing plus, so C prime equals C plus some constant uh, times 2 pi i boundary of y to the 2n, okay? And so, dually, you can interpret that as an action of the motivic Galois group on the number on the odd zeta value. And so that's equivalent um, to saying that the motivic Galois group transforms the odd zeta value and modifies its value by adding some multiple of 2 pi i to the 2n plus 1. And as we know, or as you might know from my other lectures, that this is indeed how the Betty motivic Galois group acts on motivic multiple zeta values. Um, so this is um, so in some sense the, the, the fact that um, the, the co-cycle of an Einstein series has this this transcendental term in it is really fundamental because it reflects. Um, the first non-trivial piece of the action of the motivic Galois group. Right. Um, so now let me retranslate these. Um, so these are all groups of automorphisms acting on groups. It's simpler to think in terms of Lie algebras. Lie algebra reformulation. So now let me take um, G11 to be the G11 drum. So I'm going to drop the Durams because um, it gets a bit tedious. Oh no, okay, I'll, I'll be, I'll, I'll keep the Durams then. Why not? Um, U11 is the Lie algebra of the unipotent radical of the relative completion. And U H is the Lie algebra of this unipotent radical of this, this Galois group. Then, um, if we translate all the above stuff into Lie algebras, then we get an action of this Lie algebra U drum H on the Lie algebra of relative completion via, in the following extremely specific way. So it, um, having chosen a splitting as before, it's going to map to this semi-direct product. And then it goes to the SL2 equivariant derivations of this Lie algebra. And so given a, an element sigma, it will always manifest itself in a, the very specific form of B delta, where the equivalence relation on these derivations is that B delta 
is equivalent to B plus A delta minus adjoint of A for any A in U11 SL2 invariant. Now this, this equivalence relation shouldn't frighten you because as we see from this picture here, there are actually not very many SL2 equivariant elements in this Lie algebra. You have to go quite far, you have to take quite complicated comp commutators before you even see the first invariant element. So we can really sort of ignore this as a first approximation. And as I'll explain, the, we can also think of delta as an approximation as well. And so the, the, um, these metallic elements can really be thought of to first order in terms of just an element in this Lie algebra, which, which we understand fairly well. <coughs> uh, sorry? Oh, this is equivalence relation. Oh, sigma, sigma is some element in here. But it doesn't appear on the map. So sigma maps to, along this map, sigma so sigma is an, al is, is an element of the Lie algebra of automorphisms of this category. I don't see sigma in the result. So. Uh, no, well, these it should depend on sigma, I suppose. B sigma, delta sigma, yeah. Yes, you're right. It, it, this, the B and delta depend on sigma, but I'm just saying if you give a, a sigma, let me call the image B delta. <coughs> um, and the image of this, but there was this inertial condition the image lands in the subspace of derivations satisfying the Lie algebra version of this condition, which is B comma N plus delta N equals zero. So this is the inertial condition where N is the logarithm of T kappa plus. And I claim that we can, we can write this down more or less explicitly. It's, it's, it's something like, I actually didn't prepare again, but it uh, involves a sum of E to N plus two X to the two N with some Bernoulli number factor here and some, some coefficient. So N, N to lowest order is a power series that involves all the Eisenstein series with some Bernoulli number coefficient coming in here. Um, so this is something that's, this element n is something quite concrete, and we know a lot about it. So we have a Lie algebra of derivations that respect this condition. This is something very concrete. You could put this on a computer, if you like, and, um, and, and explore it. So now define um, U, M, 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 respectively, it's Lie algebra U, M, 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 to be the image of UH so this is um, so UH we've got so what is UMMM another way to think about it is that UMMM is the Lie algebra of the unipotent radical of Oort tensor MMM of omega Duran. So the, the, the category of mixed modular motives, as I defined it earlier, is a Tanakian category. It's completely determined by its, its, its Galois group, and this is, the, this is the unipotent radical. So this beast completely describes all the extensions, well, it describes everything about this category, but it, it, in particular, um, it gives us all the information about extensions and iterated extensions in the category MMM gamma. So the holy grail is to, to get a presentation, write down generators and relations of this Lie algebra. So if we knew that, then we would know exactly which, uh, exactly the, the structure of the category of mixed modular motives. So that's exactly what I'm going to try to do now. Um, First, I want to explain on this geometric picture what this constraint is. 
So every, the upshot of this is that every, uh, I'll call these Mativic Lie elements, UMMM, can always be represented by a pair B delta, so as, as Cathy pointed out, I should have the dependence on sigma, but I, I'm lazy. And what we think of, we call um, B sigma is the geometric part, and delta sigma we call the arithmetic part. There are reasons for this. So let's draw a picture. We can, in the same um, spirit, we can draw a picture of the Lie algebra, of, of the derivation algebra of this Lie algebra. Um, I'll put it up here. So um, if the Lie algebra has a mixed hot structure, then its derivation algebra also has a mixed hot structure. In other words, the derivation algebra of this is an object of the category H. And if we draw a picture of it, uh, with the M and W filtrations, then we have this line M equals W, that's the line in red on this picture, and given any, if I have some metabolic element here, I, I, if I want to ask what are the possible, what are the elements of, of, a, of a given uh, type, of a given weight, so they'll be in, in a certain M column, they'll be in a fixed M column, and they will look like this. So we have the delta part. So the delta part is SL2 equivariant. And as I mentioned earlier, if you're SL2 equivariant, you've got to lie on the diagonal. So the delta part entirely sits the arithmetic part sits in this slot here. And then we have all this stuff here, which is add of B. And we call the, so what I should say, that when I write an element like this, I'm really choosing a splitting of the W filtration, but the intuition is, 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 is perfect. Um, the top part, which is canonical, is called the geometric head and then so there's all this stuff given by B this is just given by an element of the Lie algebra U and then there's an arithmetic part which is mysterious slightly mysterious and then there's all the rest there's an infinite tail that goes down in the W filtration so that's the picture of um, of a Mativic Lie algebra element. And I emphasize, you know, to, to draw this picture, we, what it implicitly means is that we split the W and M filtrations. Um, but that's fine, as I explained earlier. So now it gets fun because we have all these filtrations and all these constraints, and we can do some detective work on what possible derivations there can be. And the first point is the inertia condition um, implies a whole bunch of stuff, but two things that are very important. And the first one is that the geometric head, so that bit up there, is always a lowest weight vector. So that already poses a strong constraint um, on, 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 on what derivations are possible. So here we see we could have we could have a an element sigma whose who's, who's geometric head is this gadget here. And in fact, that there is such a one. It exists, and it corresponds to zeta, the zeta 3 extension we saw earlier. Then you could ask whether there's a, a derivation whose geometric head is, is this element here. Turns out there can be no such element, and so on and so forth. And the other fact that the inertia condition gives is that this infinite head is, in fact, uniquely determined. So once you know what, what it looks like sort of above the, the diagonal, then you know all the rest. So that's determined by this inertia condition 
um, v comma n and delta n equals zero. All right, so at last, um, then I can state a theorem about what we know about these derivations. Oh, sorry, yeah, no, I missed a, 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 a key point. I'm slightly out of time. I'll just get to the punchline. So uh, the, the point is that an element sigma in the abelianization of MMM is equivalent to extensions in the category MMM of SL2Z. So we really desperately want to know exactly what derivations are possible because it tells us how to construct extensions, which is an important problem. And so to exhibit, I won't explain the, the, the machine, but to, to construct such a non-trivial element, you, the key point is that you have to compute a period. You compute a period, which is essentially a regulator, and that's an analytic argument, and that enables you to deduce that some, some, some element actually exists as non-zero. That's image is non-zero. OK, so there's a whole machine to do that. But the, the conclusion then is, is theorem 1. Um, there exist. So these are non-canonical. It's the, the abelianizations are canonical. Um, so there exist, first of all, we have zeta elements. So I call these sigma 2n plus 1 in UMMM for all n. And they have a, a hot structure. They are of type. Q um, 2n plus 1. And what do they look like? Well, they have the geometric head minus 2 over 2n factorial Eisenstein y to the 2n plus dot, dot, dot. There's, there's a geometric part. We know, the uh, we know the next term, I think. I think I know the next term in this. Well, essentially nearly all of it in any, in any case. And then there's an arithmetic part, and then there's an infinite tail. And the arithmetic part, um, I actually know this to first order. So I know how it acts on, on this Lie algebra, and it's, just, it's extremely interesting. And it involves some very bizarre quotient of, of two different Bernoulli numbers, um, somewhat bizarrely. Um, and these correspond to to zeta 2n plus 1. Another way to say it is that in the category MMM, they correspond to extensions of Tate motive by um, 2n plus 1. So it shows that th these extensions exist in the category MMM. Uh, equivalently, the, the, period, the odd zeta values appear as multiple modular values. And the proof is, we, we nearly did it. Um, the proof is obtained by computing um, an integral of an Eisenstein series. And that produced, in the co-boundary part, it produced this odd zeta value. And that shows that these derivations, the machine that shows that they exist and they're non-trivial. Then there's something completely new, which are modular elements. So. They, they come in, in, in sort of pairs. Um, for all f cusp form of weight, sorry, uh, for, uh, for every cusp, so we had a basis of cusp forms with rational coefficients, fewer coefficients, and the integer d is any integer bigger than or equal to the weight of f. And what do these look like? Um, let me just write down the one with the single prime, the double prime is identical. So we get some, the geometric part uh, is some coefficients that are, that are perfectly computable. And then we get a commutator EF prime 
y to some power um, an Eisenstein part y to some other power times x1 y2. So this is the notation I mentioned uh, in an earlier lecture to some power plus dot 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 dot. Um, so the geometric head then is, is a commutator of a cost form in an Eisenstein series. And you get a whole bunch of them, and the coefficients that occur are the coefficients that turn up in the period polynomial of f. Um, so these are non-trivial, non and they correspond to the L values LFD. Um, so these derivations are, they are of type, they are of modular type, and they prove that there are non-trivial extensions in MMM of Q by VFD for sufficiently large D, bigger than the weight. So, um, and the proof of that is Rankin-Selberg, or variant of Rankin-Selberg. <coughs> So there are no elements, there are no der possible der uh, motivic elements that have just a cusp form as their geometric head. They do not exist. Um, so there do not exist elements with a geometric head of the form EF prime or double prime y to the 2n. And that has a lot of important consequences, but I'll, I'll skip that. OK, then theorem two, which is um, uh, an analog of, of the delaney harrow conjecture in P1 minus two points, is that we can deduce freeness. The zeta elements uh, and the modular elements generate a free, a free Lie subalgebra. So um, this, is, this is great because it means that um, the corollary is that there exists a huge supply of mixed modular motives. So essentially these are, mixed modular mo these are motives of mixed Tate modular type. And it's saying that if you, if you specify extension data uh, arbitrary extension data, then you can construct at least one example of a mixed modular motive with um, an, an iterated multi-extension with whatever extension data you like. Um, so, yeah. So it basically says we have uh, the... Uh, there's some caveats here, but it, 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 uh, it says that the... the the, the category of mixed modular motives is doing what it should. It's, it's generating every single e example that we can hope to find. Which leads me on to my next question. Um, is that can we expect to find all uh, the um, extensions as predicted by Balinson? predicted by Benison's conjecture. So the point is that the story doesn't just stop here. There shouldn't be z2 and modular elements, but there should be a whole infinite sequence of, of more and more generators. In fact, we should expect to find extensions in MMM of the trivial object by symmetric powers And uh, I'll just write down the final theorem and stop. So we should get extensions of this type, or certainly they should exist somewhere in nature. And the question is, do they occur in relative completion? And these should correspond to derivations if they occur, if they can be exhibited as mixed modular motives, um, sigma v in u m m n. And here comes the spanner 
theorem three, which is very surprising? And the answer is no. That I was absolutely um, astonished to discover that if we write the, uh, the weight of each modular form fi, call it ni, sorry, 2ni plus 2, then define a quantity L of v to be 2d, which is the take twist here, minus some 2ik nk plus 1, then if L of v is less than minus 3, I think it might be less than or equal to, but I have a doubt, um, then these extensions cannot occur. So this is um, extremely surprising. It means that um, if Benningson is right and that these extensions exist as motives, then in fact we cannot find them in this geometric setting. And I have no idea where in nature where to find such things. And the funny thing is that this condition, so there's a formula due to Carlson that, it, that tells you what the rank of this X, X group in the category of real mixed hot structures is. So we know what the dimension of this space should be. And when this condition is satisfied, it's almost always zero. So it's very unusual to, that you expect to see some extension that is ruled out by this theorem. They're very rare. So there's a tiny fraction of mativic extensions that should be out there that we cannot capture using relative completion in this way. And this is a big mystery. I think the first time such an extension happens, so the, the way that this can happen is when you have many modular forms whose weights are very close to each other and, and d is very small. And then occasionally you can be in this, in this no-go zone of this theorem. But in the generic case, when d is very large, um, there's absolutely enough space uh, in this derivation algebra for them to exist, and I expect them to exist, and I expect them to generate a freely algebra. So the questions I raised at the beginning of the lecture, do, um, does relative completion generate all mixed modular motives? Well, the answer is yes and no. Yes, in the sense that um, we have these types of freeness theorems that show that you get pretty much everything once you have the, once you have the, the, the simple extensions. But not all the simple extensions seem to be there in the first place. And that's an absolute mystery and a place to stop.